For what purpose does the gentleman from Washington rise? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days to revise and extend the remarks and include extraneous material on the bill H.R. 3409. Without objection. <laughs> Pursuant to House Resolution 788 and Rule 18, the chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of H.R. 3409. The chair appoints the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latriat, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the consideration of H.R. 3409, which the clerk will report by title. A bill to limit the authority of the Secretary of the Interior to issue regulations before December 31, 2013, under the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act of 1977. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. General debate shall be confined to the bill and amendments specified in House Resolution 788 and shall not exceed one hour, equally divided among and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Natural Resources, the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Energy and Commerce, and the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. The gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings, and the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah, and the gentleman from uh, West Virginia, Mr. Rahal, each will control 10 minutes. And the House will be in order. And the chair would recognize the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in his 2008 campaign, President Obama plainly declared the policies he supports would bankrupt American coal production. Since taking office, the Obama administration has waged a multi-front multi -front on coal, on coal jobs, on the small businesses in the mining supply chain, and on the low-cost energy that millions of Americans rely on. Mr. Chairman, the House is not in order. The gentleman is correct. The committee will be in order, and the chair would ask members engaged in conversation in the aisleways, at the back of the chamber, who aren't involved in this discussion, to remove their conversations from the floor. Please take your seats. Okay, gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, amazingly, the Obama administration has repeatedly tried to deny that they've launched a war on coal. Yet the facts are stubborn things. Just this week, Alpha Natural Resources announced the closure of eight coal mines that will cost over 1,200 good-paying jobs. Aggressive regulations were specifically cited by the company for the closure of these mines. New regulations opposed by the Obama EPA threatened to shut down the Navajo Generating Station, a coal-fired plant in Arizona. This would cost hundreds of jobs and eliminate millions of dollars in revenue for Navajo tribal economic development, education, and basic, research, basic services. These lost jobs aren't random events. They are the direct result of the policies and actions of the Obama administrations. These are the outcomes of the regulatory war on coal. For more than a year and a half, the Natural Resources Committee has been aggressively investigating one of the Obama administration's most covert but outrageous fronts in this war, a decision by the Interior Department to rapidly rewrite a regulation governing coal mining near streams. Within days of taking office, the Obama administration simply threw out the stream buffer zone rule that had undergone five years of environmental analysis and public review. They used a short-circuited process to hire a contractor to write this new regulation. But when the news, re uh, news media revealed official analysis of this rewrite and of the new Obama regulation would cost 7,000 jobs and cause economic harm in 22 states, the administration fired the contractor and continued to charge ahead. 
To date, the committee's investigation has, has exposed gross mismanagement of the rulemaking process, potential political interference, and the widespread economic harm this regulation would cause. The Interior Department refuses to comply with congressional subpoenas to produce documents and information that would fully reveal how and why this regulation was being rewritten. An interim report by the committee was issued today that details specific findings and information uncovered in this investigation. The report is available at the committee website at naturalresources.house.gov. So, Mr. Chairman, it's not a matter of if the new Obama regulation will be opposed, but when. Television cameras overheard President Obama whispering to, to Russian Prime Minister that he'll have more flexibility after the election. It doesn't take a canary in the coal mine, and no pun intended, to figure out the Interior Department's new stream buffer zone regulation on coal is being held back and concealed until after the November election, when this president would have more flexibility to unleash its job-destroying impacts. That's why Congress, Mr. Chairman, must act now to stop this. This new regulation must be halted. Title I of today's bill, the Stop War on Coal Act, is authored by our colleague from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, and prohibits the Obama administration from issuing this new regulation. It allows time to responsibly undertake an open, transparent rulemaking that fairly accounts for job and economic impacts. President Obama's war on coal is real. The lost jobs are already happening, and thousands more are at, are at risk. America's energy costs are already too high, and the war on coal will drive them even higher. So I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle and from all regions in the country to support this bill and stop these red tape attacks on American jobs and American-made energy. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentleman's recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise in opposition to this bill. The Republicans are saying that there is a war on coal, but the only battle coal is losing is in the free market to natural gas, to wind, and to solar. Just four years ago, coal generated 51% of the electricity in the United States. Now it is down to 35%. And when you add up hydropower, the renewables, the natural gas, the other gases, you get 44% of our electricity sector. But just like Governor Romney says he has given up on 47% of Americans, the House, Repu the House Republicans have given up on 44% of our electricity sector. Just like their politics grips tightly to the past, their energy policies hold fast to the energy technologies and the fuels of yesterday, like coal and oil. The free market has been replacing coal with natural gas, which has grown from 21% of our electricity generation uh, back in 2005 and 2006, and now it has risen to 30% of all electrical generation in the United States, natural gas. It's not a war. It's a revolution. And what has happened is, simultaneously, coal has come down to 35%. Surprising, isn't it? The numbers look like they match up pretty perfectly, especially if you add up the rise from 1% to 4% of the electricity in the United States, which is now generated by wind over the last five years. That's what's happening, ladies and gentlemen. And all the rest of this... I don't understand, to be honest with you. It's almost like the Republicans are rejecting the free market as it is now operating, as the country is moving to natural gas. And I understand the coal state members have to stand up and uh, to defend this change in the marketplace, but I don't understand why my other Republican friends uh, would reject those free market principles. And why is this switch from coal to natural gas happening? It's because natural gas is cheaper. Natural gas prices have decreased by 66% since 2008. 
it is cheaper to produce new electricity from natural gas than from coal. This isn't a conspiracy, it is a competition. But Republicans say that there is a war on coal. Well, in a market sense, uh, that war is now being won. When I was a boy, I had to go down into the basement with my father to shovel the coal. That's how we kept our house warm. And then my mother said, let's move to home heating oil. And so my father had the home heating oil come. That was a revolution. And now there's another revolution going on. Up in the Northeast, for example, because of the low price of natural gas, 1.4 million Northeast households have switched from oil to natural gas over the last decade. And why is that? Again, it costs $2,238 to heat your home for the winter with home heating oil. It costs $629 to heat your home with natural gas. That's why they're switching. The same thing is happening in the petrochemical industry. They're switching from oil over to natural gas. Fertilizer industry, from oil over to natural gas. The price is low. It, they are moving in that direction. That's the larger story that is occurring. The natural gas revolution in the United States of America. So ladies and gentlemen, I just urge all of you to understand that this is not the Obama administration and a war against coal. That is not what is going on. There is a paranoia-inducing paranoia Darwinian marketplace revolution that is taking place, led by natural gas, followed by wind, that is changing the makeup of the electricity marketplace in our country. And only when you understand and admit this will we be able to have a real debate out here. Because all the rest of this is really just meant to be political, uh, to harm the president in the election of uh, 2012, when the real harm to coal is being done in the marketplace. So I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves, the gentleman from Washington. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm very pleased to yield two minutes to the Chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Rogers. The gentleman from Kentucky. I thank the Chairman for yielding. During his uh, 2008 election campaign, President Obama had the audacity to set an energy goal to bankrupt the coal industry. Unfortunately, this is one promise the President is keeping. Coal mines are closing, miners being sent home, our strategic energy advantage thrown away for windmills and cylinders. Mr. Chairman, I know miners, uh, day in and day out. They make real personal sacrifices, often doing difficult, at times dangerous jobs, not only to look out for their families, but to keep our homes lit, support their local churches, keep our local businesses flourishing, and helping the American economy. Coal is not America's energy problem, it's America's energy solution. Sadly, the last three years this administration has brought forth an onslaught of job-killing regulations, overstepping authority, three times condemned by the federal court, and deadlocked the mine permitting process, all with the thinly veiled purpose of driving coal from the energy marketplace. In Kentucky, the results are in. In my region, more than 2,000 coal miners have lost their jobs this year. Dozens of local support businesses are downsizing as a result. The story is the same in Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, where last, last week 1,200 more workers were given pink slips. It's time for this to stop, Mr. Chairman. This war on coal is real. It threatens the way of life in these small town communities with rich legacies and real people, our countrymen. Mr. Chairman, I'm proud to stand in support of coal miners and coal communities and support the Stop the War on Coal Act, H.R. 3409. It sends a clear message that the Obama policies are wrong-headed, not only for coal, but for our country. I urge passage and put coal miners back to work. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Yes, I, I yield the uh, remainder of our time to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holt. The gentleman has five minutes remaining. Thank you, uh, 
thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, thank the, my colleague, the ranking member on the committee. This Republican-led House has already cast 302, soon to be more, anti-environmental votes in this Congress. In our last week in session, before the election in November, our only eighth day in session since the beginning of August, the majority now wants to use this precious time when we should be dealing with the nation's economic problems Instead, we are planning to consider legislation on the floor that will add to this total of anti-environmental votes. No, there is no war on coal, uh, not by the Obama administration or anyone else. Uh, Mr. Markey has explained the market forces at work. But there clearly has been a concerted effort, one out of every five votes we've taken in this in this uh, Congress uh, to reduce protections on our air, on our water, on our open spaces, etc. Now this bill includes a coal ash title that endangers the health and safety of thousands of communities. Provisions that would increase the levels of toxic mercury, lead, and cancer-causing toxins in the air and the water. Provisions in this bill that gut the Clean Air Act. Why the House would waste precious time re-debating these bills and voting on them once again is a mystery to me and I think must be a mystery to anyone who is observing the behavior of this House of Representatives. It only underscores the fact that the House Republican majority is more focused on passing message bills than addressing the real issues that face our nation. The remaining new title of this bill consists of a, of a bill that was approved in the Resources Committee back in February. It purports to halt an ongoing effort by the Obama administration to rewrite a so-called midnight regulation that was adopted by the Bush administration on mountaintop removal mining. This Bush, meantime, midnight, mount, this Bush Midnight Mountaintop Removal Rule weakened a Reagan-era regulation by increasing the ability of the mining companies to dump mining waste in streams. Yes, believe it or not, they want to weaken those protections, and that's what this, it's, it's another provision of this bill before us today. The Obama administration has signaled that it intends to revise the Bush administration regulation to better protect local communities, to better protect public health, to better protect the water. However, this effort is only at the very early stages, and the Obama administration has not even issued a proposed rule. So this is unnecessary going in the wrong direction, weakening environmental protections uh, for this country. So those are reasons enough to oppose this bill. I reserve the balance of my time. The uh, gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Washington. Uh, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chairman, how much time on both sides? Well, you have three and a half minutes left, and uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts has a minute and a half. Has how much? A minute and a half. I will then yield. Uh, I have three and a half minutes. You do. I do. I will you be do. more than happy to yield three minutes to the author of the legislation that's accompanied in Title I of this bill, the gentleman from uh, Ohio, Mr. Johnson. The gentleman from Ohio. I thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chairman, for yielding me the time. I must, uh, I must say uh, the, the, my colleague just commented on uh, the Bush administration's rewrite of the stream buffer zone rule that took five years. He qualified that as a midnight rewrite. Uh, my goodness, that was a really long night. It took five years to do it. You know, today I rise in strong support of legislation that I've sponsored to stop the administration's job-destroying war on coal. This legislation is in direct response to the president's ongoing rewrite of the stream buffer zone rule. A rule that, according to the administration's own estimates, would cost at least 7,000 direct jobs 
and potentially tens of thousands direct and indirect jobs. Mere days after assuming office, President Obama set out to rewrite this rule that will cost tens of thousands of jobs, cut coal production by up to 50 percent in America, and cause electricity rates to skyrocket even higher than the President has already pushed them. Because as we all know, the average utility bill for the middle class has risen over $300 a year because of this President's radical environmental policies. The last thing the middle class needs is their utility bills to go even higher. However, if the story ended there, it wouldn't be bad enough. But it doesn't end there. It actually gets much worse. The President's administration has deliberately tried to hide the truth about the cost of this rule to the American public. In fact, a presidential appointee asked the contractors working on the rule to lie about the job loss numbers so the administration could convince the American public that this rule was good public policy. Thankfully, the contractors were men and women of character and would not lie for the administration. The president's administration then fired those contractors. The Natural Resources Committee has subpoenaed the administration for documents and audio recordings relating to the rule. Not surprisingly, as we have seen many times before, the president has failed to live up to his campaign promise of leading the most open, transparent government ever because he has not allowed the administration to turn over the documents that we've asked for because he knows they will hurt his reelection prospects. But this legislation is not about a sloppy and unethical rules process. This legislation is about saving tens of thousands of jobs for hardworking Americans. And it's about providing reliable, affordable energy sources for hardworking taxpayers and businesses all across America. Throughout the country, hardworking coal miners and utility plant workers are losing their jobs because of this president's radical environmental policies. Just this week, hundreds of coal miners were told they would lose their jobs because of the president's anti-coal stance. Just today, a utility company announced that they would close a coal-fired power plant and hundreds more workers would lose their jobs. These job losses are in addition to the thousands of Ohioans in eastern and southeastern Ohio that have lost their jobs because of the president's radical policies. I give the gentleman an additional 15 seconds. This legislation will bring a stop to the administration's war on coal by not only stopping the job-destroying rewrite of the stream buffer zone rule, but it also contains four bipartisan bills that have already been passed through the House. I urge all of my colleagues to support this job-saving legislation, and with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. The gentleman from Massachusetts actually controls the time. You have a minute and a half. And, and I, I uh, yield the balance of our time to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holt. Gentleman from New Jersey. I thank Mr. Markey. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this legislation is drafted so broadly that it's likely to cause uh, uh, real damage. Uh, it would prevent the Interior Department from issuing nearly any new regulation under the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. The bill would prevent the Interior Department from undertaking any of a number of actions that it is considering to ensure that mining operations are safe for the workers and for the public and for our environment. Uh, I filed an amendment to narrow the scope of this title, uh, but the majority uh, would not make it in order. Furthermore, H.R. 3409 would completely paralyze the Office of Surface Mining, which is responsible for protecting the citizens and the workers, and we should not limit this agency when it comes to worker safety. It would threaten, this bill would threaten public health by blocking the critical Clean Air Act regulations that limit dangerous air pollutants, as I said earlier, including mercury in the air that we breathe. This is an irresponsible bill. It is unnecessary. We have important work to do to shore up this economy and to create jobs. And why in the world we are doing this is beyond anybody's reasonable expl expect, uh, explanation. I yield back the balance of the time. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Washington has 15 seconds. I'll do my best to, to, uh, to capsulize that. I yield myself the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman, it was the President when he was a candidate that said that his policies, if, if enacted, would cost coal jobs. 
For three, for nearly four years, we have seen evidence of that, and the latest example of that was when Alpha Coal Company laid off 1,200 people, citing the regulations that the president said he would promulgate. This is a good bill. I urge its adoption. Gentlemen, back. Gentlemen's capsule has expired. It's uh, now in order to hear from the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, will each control 10 minutes. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky. Thank you very much. And uh, I must say that I'm a little bit shocked that people would be uh, so critical of this bill and saying that this bill is not important. All of us know that President Obama, when he was running for president, made the comment that if he's elected president, you could build a coal-powered plant, but he would bankrupt the industry. And our friends on the other side of the aisle say, well, coal is having problems today because natural gas prices are going down. And so let's let the free market work. And uh, coal's losing out because of these natural gas prices. But the truth of the matter is, if, if, if natural gas prices were higher than they had been in the history of America, under this administration, if they finalize the greenhouse gas regulation, you cannot build a new coal-powered plant in America. And so one of the things that this bill does is it simply says, no, you are not going to regulate the greenhouse gases with this, with this uh, regulation. The second thing that it does is that this administration has been more aggressive than any in recent history on regulating the coal industry. So the second thing that we do is we simply require the Department of Commerce to lead an interagency committee that will complete an analysis of key EPA, EPA rules and regulations and the impact that they have on jobs in America, on our ability to compete in the global marketplace, on the energy prices, on energy reliability, and on the benefits. What is so radical about that? an interagency task force to simply examine the cost of these accumulation of regulations, impact on energy prices, impact on global competitiveness, impact on energy reliability. What is so radical about that? And then finally, the third thing that it does is we say we're going to establish minimum federal requirements for the management of coal ash. Coal ash has been used in America for 50 years or more to build highways and to be used in concrete. And so all we're saying, we're going to set a minimum federal standard and we're going to let the states enforce it through enforceable permits. And then EPA can get into the action if they want to, if the state fails to act. So I don't view this as anything radical. But if you go to any coal mine today and you tell people that work in those coal mines that this administration is not harming their ability to work, I think you would be facing a losing argument. And one of the things that upsets me the most about all of these regulations is that when Lisa Jackson comes to testify, she talks about all of the benefits from a health perspective. And I would be the first to acknowledge our air today is cleaner than it has ever been, and all of us can take pleasure in that and feel very proud of that and the effectiveness that the Clean Air Act has given us. So. The important thing today is to recognize 
that there are diminishing returns in these additional regulations. And if you look at the cost to the coal miner and his family when they lose their health care, EPA does not look at the impact that that will have, the cost that that will have to society. But they look at models and they determine that maybe next year they're going to prevent 1,000, 1 million people from having asthma, which is quite subjective. So this is a reasonable piece of legislation that simply s tries to slow down EPA, particularly at a time when our economy is weak, when we're trying to create jobs, not lose jobs, and when we're trying to be and remain competitive in the global marketplace with countries like China that are stepping up the use of their coal. And we're sitting here with a 225-year reserve of coal, and I would uh, reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. Over the past two years, this Republican House has amassed the most anti-environment record in the history of Congress. During this period, the Republican House has voted more than 300 times on the floor to weaken long-standing public health and environmental protections, block important environmental standards, and even halt environmental research. It's an appalling record. I remember a time when there was bipartisan support for protecting the environment. Some of our best allies were Republicans, like former Science Committee Chairman Sherry Bollert. It would have been unthinkable then to bring a bill that eviscerates the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act to the floor. But those days are apparently over. Our last order of business before the election in 2012 is this bill, H.R. 3409. This is the single worst anti-environment bill to be considered during the most anti-environment House of Representatives in history. Under the guise of protecting coal mining jobs, House Republicans have resurrected their most extreme anti-environmental bills. This new Frankenstein legislation is a sweeping attack on environmental protection, many of which have nothing to do with coal. It's an all-out assault on America's bedrock environmental protections. Since 1970, when Richard Nixon was the President of the United States, the U.S. has had a national policy that air should be safe enough for people to breathe. The Republican bill that we're considering today would overturn this policy and cut the heart out of the Clean Air Act by allowing air quality standards to be set on the basis of polluter profits rather than health. This would reverse decades of progress in cleaning up our air. And the gentleman that just last spoke on the floor said it was great. He likes the, ha the fact that we have cleaner air, but enough is enough. The standards, the, the standards that we see being changed would not, no longer be based on health. The bill also nullifies EPA's rules to require power plants to finally reduce their emissions of toxic mercury, which can cause brain damage and learning disabilities in infants and children. Blocking reductions in toxic air pollution means more heart attacks, more asthma attacks, more emergency room visits, and more premature deaths. Well, we've had enough of those kinds of clean air. We've got to go backwards and allow toxic pollution to do harm to so many people. But the bill doesn't stop there. It would overturn, overturn the Obama administration's historic vehicle fuel efficiency and carbon pollution standards. These standards are supported by the auto industry. 
because they provide the industry with regulatory certainty and a single national program. The standards will boost our energy independence by saving over two million barrels of oil a day. They will save consumers thousands of dollars at the pump over the life of a vehicle. The savings to American consumers will be equivalent to lowering gasoline prices by a, do a dollar per gallon. These standards that the Republican bill would overturn are a victory for the auto industry, consumers, and the environment. They have nothing to do with coal, but House Republicans are targeting them anyway. The legislation would prohibit EPA from taking any action to reduce dangerous carbon pollution. It codifies climate science denial. By overturning EPA's scientific finding that carbon pollution endangers health and welfare. The premise of Title II of this bill is that climate change is a hoax. The bill even eliminates the existing requirement that oil refineries, chemical plants, and other large polluters disclose how much carbon pollution they are releasing. The signs that climate change is already occurring are all around us. The recent wildfires, drought, and heat waves are exactly the types of extreme weather events that scientists have been, been predicting for years. The House Republican solution to the greatest environmental challenge of our time is to bury their heads in the sand and pretend it isn't happening. And they call this bill a moderate, not extreme one. This assault on the nation's environmental laws will be the last order of business before the House adjourns for the election. It won't go anywhere in the Senate. It is a partisan political bill that is distracting us from dealing with the real problems facing our nation, like creating jobs and strengthening our economy. We should stay here, Mr. Chairman, and do some real work for a change. This political bill is the wrong direction for America. I urge my colleagues to oppose this legislation, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Kentucky. May I ask how much time we have remaining? May I ask how much time we have remaining on our side? Kentucky has four and a half minutes remaining. Thank you. This time I'd like to yield one minute to the gentlelady from Tennessee, who is a valuable member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. The gentlelady is recognized for how many minutes? One minute. One minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman from Kentucky for his good work on this piece of legislation. You know, Mr. Speaker, there is a war being waged on energy and on coal in this country, but it's not coming from another country. It is coming from our own government, and we see this taking place every day. Here are a few facts. The United States produces 35 percent of the world's coal, which is more than any other country in the entire world. Most Americans think that we should be using our natural resources to improve the quality of life and to benefit our citizens, and indeed we should. We have more than 250 billion tons of recoverable coal here in this country. Coal produced about 42 percent of all the electricity that was generated in the U.S. last year. And shutting down the coal industry might sound like a good idea at the Sierra Club meeting, but it doesn't make any sense. This legislation is needed because it puts the brakes on the EPA. I encourage my colleagues to support Fired. the bill. Gentleman from Kentucky Reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, we we uh, continue to reserve our time. The gentleman from California Reserve. gentleman from Kentucky. At this time, I'd like to yield uh, one minute to the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley. The gentleman from West Virginia is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise today in an effort to stop this administration's war on coal. Those who believe that there is no war on coal are in dangerous denial. The actions of this administration against coal have caused massive uncertainty in the marketplace. This war, Obama's war on coal, has come in waves. First with a retroactive 
retracting a, a mine water permit, shutting down a coal mine, new source performance standards, shutting down all new coal mine construction, utility mac, shutting down all existing powerhouses, boiler mac, particular matter, stream buffer rule, treating coal ash as a hazardous material, cross-state air pollutions, slow walking over 900 coal mining permits, and on. I'm here to support this coal ash provision with this. The majority in the House and the Senate have already, four times, already passed this concept. They support this issue. This is not a war on coal, though. It's a war on the communities that mine coal. When you shut down a coal mine, you shut down concrete block tim suppliers, timber cribbing, machinists who maintain the motors and equipment, electrical workers. Gentleman from Kentucky Reserves, gentleman from California. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I inquire how much time is on each side? Uh, the gentleman from California has three and three quarters minutes remaining. The gentleman from Kentucky has two and a half minutes remaining. We have an additional speaker who's on his way, so I would like to continue to reserve. The gentleman from California Reserves, gentleman from Kentucky. At this time, I would uh, yield one minute to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan who's the Vice Chairman of the Energy and Power Subcommittee. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today in strong support of H.R. 3909, the Stop War on Coal Act. This bill would help reverse the negative impact of the President Obama's coal policies and protect American jobs from overregulation by the EPA. The Obama administration is trying to regulate what they don't have the votes to legislate, and it's costing American jobs. Just this week, Alpha Natural Resources announced the elimination of 1,200 jobs due to Obama administration's hostility towards the coal industry. The relief this bill provides cannot come soon enough. One of the main provisions of the bill is the TRAIN Act. It's a bipartisan legislation I authored in the House this past year. The TRAIN Act forces EPA to conduct an in-depth cost-benefit analysis of their most expensive power sector regulations so the American people can fully understand how the EPA's train wreck of regulations is impacting our economy. At its heart, the TRAIN Act simply asks these questions. What do these EPA regulations mean for the ability to compete in a global marketplace? Will electricity prices climb and by how much? How would higher electricity prices and power plant closures affect jobs in the U.S. economy? This is the right thing to do, and I urge, I urge the passage of this measure. The gentleman from Kentucky Reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. Continue reserve. The gentleman from California Reserves. The gentleman from Kentucky. At this time, I would yield one minute to the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo, a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. The gentleman from Kansas is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, when you think of coal and jobs, you don't necessarily think of Kansas. Uh, but in Kansas, we depend on affordable, abundant energy to build airplanes, to grow crops, all of the things that come with affordable energy. Uh, this legislation uh, stopping the president's war on coal is important to jobs, not only in coal country, but in Kansas and every place we're trying for economic growth all across the country. Uh, it's simply uh, impossible to imagine how you can regulate an industry and try and shut down any new coal-fired power plants and then try and take money and subsidize it and think you've got good energy policy all across America. Uh, it should come as no surprise. We have 23 million people out of work, economic growth under 2 percent, uh, and these EPA regulations that continue one on top of another are a primary cause of that. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Kentucky. We, we have no further speakers on this side, so I would like to reserve the, the 30 seconds to close. Gentleman from Kentucky has 45 seconds remaining, and he reserves. Gentleman from California. Mr. Chairman, I yield two minutes to the distinguished gentleman from the state of New Jersey, an important member of our committee, the, chair, the ranking member of the Health Subcommittee, Frank Pallone, two minutes. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. I, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to speak in opposition to H.R. 3409, another in a string of bills put forth by the most anti-environment House in the history of Congress. I'd like to specifically reference Title V of the legislation, which bars EPA from reviewing permits that allow mining companies to dump the material they blast off the top of mountains into streams and valleys. 
Last year, EPA issued a decision to reject proposed disposal of mountaintop mining waste into West Virginia streams on the Spruce Mine No. 1 property. Let me stress that this was an extremely rare action taken by EPA and the first time it has used the Clean Water Act to overturn an approved mining permit. This mine would have dumped 110 million cubic yards of coal mine waste into nearby streams, burying more than six miles of high quality streams in Logan County and causing permanent damage to the ecosystem. The surface mining in the steep slopes of Appalachia has disrupted the biological integrity of an area about the size of Delaware, buried approximately 2,000 miles of streams with mining waste and contaminated downstream areas with toxic elements. And people have been drinking the byproducts of coal waste from mountaintop removal for more than two decades. Rather than clean and clear water running out of their faucets, the people of Appalachia are left with orange or black liquid instead. But this is not just about the environment, it's about public health. The health problems caused by exposure to these chemicals and heavy metals include cancer, organ failure, and learning disabilities. Not only that, but there are multiple cases of children suffering from asthma, headaches, nausea, and other symptoms likely due to toxic contamination from coal dust. This is environmental injustice, Mr. Speaker. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle will claim EPA is killing jobs, and I disagree. What EPA is doing is protecting the people of Appalachia from exposure to toxic chemicals that are harming them. We must put a stop to the dangerous practice of mountaintop removal mining, and I'm the lead sponsor of the Clean Water Protection Act, which would do just that. I urge my colleagues to oppose this harmful legislation, and I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from California reserves. Uh, no, Mr. Gen Chairman, I'll take the rest of my time. Gentleman from California is recognized for the remainder of the time. Mr. Uh, Chairman and my colleagues, there's no war on coal. If coal is not able to compete with cheaper natural gas, that's not the government's fault. That's the market. That's the way it works. Do we blame the government for the failure of typewriter manufacturers to stay in business because they've been replaced by computers? Coal is not going to go out of business. The president said in his statement of administration policy, to be clear, the administration believes that coal is and will remain an important part of our energy mix for decades to come. For that reason, since 2009, the administration has committed nearly $6 billion in advanced coal research, development, and deployment, and continues to work with industry on important efforts to demonstrate advanced coal technologies. Let me just tell you what the American Heart Association, American Lung Association, American Public Health Association, Asthma and Allergy Foundation, Healthcare Without Harm, National Association of County and City Health Officials, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and Trust for America's Health. They say with such dramatic consequences for public health, and enormous costs from air pollution related illnesses, we urge you to stand up to the pressure of big polluters and reject H.R. 3409 for what it is, a war on lungs. That has no place at the top of Congress's legislative agenda. Coal has had a pretty good deal. They've never had to carry the full cost of burning coal because they've never had to pay for the external consequences to human health and the environment. But their failure in the market is because of lower competition. From Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm leaving to go um, talk to the speaker. America would not be where it is today economically without the use of coal. I think all of us uh, recognize that. And I would like to just read a couple of statements from recent court decisions about EPA. The court called EPA's rational, magical thinking and a stunning power for an agency to arrogate to itself. It says EPA acted arbitrarily and capriciously and in excess of its statutory authority. The president says different things at different times. When he was a candidate last time, he said that he would bankrupt the coal industry. When he's a candidate today, he says he supports the coal industry. But his administration through the EPA shows clearly that they oppose coal. The proposed greenhouse gas regulation, if finalized, 
would prohibit the building of a coal power plant in America. Time for energy and commerce has expired. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I claim time in support of the bill on behalf of the Co Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. The okay, gentleman is recognized for such time as he may consume. I yield myself such time as I may consume. Mr. Chairman, I rise in strong support of H.R. 3409, the Coal Miner Employment and Domestic Energy Infrastructure Protection Act. Almost four decades ago, Congress enacted the Clean Water Act. Congress established a system of cooperative federalism by making the federal Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, and the state partners in regulating the nation's water quality and allocated the primary responsibility for dealing with the day-to-day -day water pollution control matters to the states. For most of these, for most of all this, for almost four decades, the system of cooperative federalism between the EPA and the states has worked quite well. However, in recent years, the EPA has begun to use a questionable tactics to unsurp the state's role under the Clean Water Act in setting water quality standards and to invalidate legally issued permits by the states. EPA has decided to get involved in the implementation of state standards, second-guessing states with respect to how standards are to be implemented, and even second-guessing EPA's, EPA's own prior determinations that a state standard meets the minimum requirements of the Clean Water Act. EPA has also inserted itself into states and the Army Corps of Engineers permit issue its decisions and is second-guessing states and other agencies permitting decisions. EPA's actions increasingly are amounting to bullying of the states and are unprecedented. Title V of H.R. 3409 is the text of H.R. 2018, a bill that has already been approved by the House of Representatives overwhelmingly by a bipartisan vote. Title V of H.R. 3409 will clarify and restore a long-standing balance that has existed between the states and the EPA as co-regulators under the Clean Water Act and to preserve the authority of states to make determinations relating to their water quality standards and permitting. The language in Title V was carefully and narrowly crafted to preserve the authority of states to make decisions about their own water quality standards and permits without undue interference or second-guessing from the EPA bureaucrats in Washington with little or new knowledge of local water quality conditions. Title V reigns in the EPA from unilaterally issuing a revised or new water quality standard for a pollutant whenever a state has adopted and the EPA has already approved a water quality standard for that pollutant. Title V restricts the EPA from withdrawing its previous approval of a state's MPDES water quality permitting program or for eliminating federal financial assistance for, for a state water quality permitting program on the basis that the EPA disagrees with that state. Further, Title V restricts the EPA from objecting to MPDES permits issued by a state. Moreover, Title V clarifies that the EPA can veto an Army Corps of Engineers Clean Water Act Section 404 permitting decision when the state concurs with the veto. These limitations apply only in situations where the EPA is attempting to contradict and unilaterally force its own one-size-fits-all federal policies on the state's water quality program. By limiting such overreaching by the EPA, Title V is no way affects EPA's proper role in reviewing states' permits and standards and coordination, coordinating pollution control efforts by the states. EPA just has to return to a more collaborative role and has long played as the overseer of the state's implementation of the Clean Water Act. Detractors of this legislation claim that the bill only intends to disrupt the complementary roles of EPA and the state under the Clean Water Act and eliminate EPA's ability to protect water quality and public health in downstream states from actions in upstream states. 
In reality, these detractors want to centralize power in the federal government so it can dominate water quality regulation in the states. Implicit in their message is that they do not trust the states in protecting the quality of their waters and the health of their citizens. Title V of H.R. 3409 returns to the balance, certainty, and cooperation between states and the federal government in regards to the environment that our economy, job creators, and the permit holders have been begging for. I urge passage of H.R. 3409 and reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. For what purpose does the gentleman from West Virginia rise? How much time do I have, Mr. Chairman? Gentleman has 10 minutes. Thank you. I, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized for such time as he may consume. I rise in support of the Stop the War on Coal Act, or as I prefer to call it, the Defense of Coal Miners Jobs Act. It has already been made clear on the this floor that America's coal industry is under siege. Coal companies themselves have been very upfront about the chief source of their troubles, their lost revenues, mine closures, and layoffs. According to coal company officials and their own corporate financial statements, the biggest factor negatively affecting coal of late has been economic, involving declining demand in metallurgical coal, softness in the thermal coal market, a slowdown in the worldwide economy, milder than expected weather, and the resulting growth in stock, coal stockpiles, all, of course, amplified by the low cost of natural gas. But when these factors began to evolve, already darkly looming over coal were the ever-tightening constrictions of the Clean Air Act, that regulatory perpetual motion machine from which rule after rule has rolled out with no regard for the condition of the economy or the effect those regulations would have on the livelihoods of American families. Meanwhile, long-running legal skirmishes, lawsuit on top of lawsuit, challenging coal mining permitting in my home state, had for decades unfairly and inhumanely left coal miners and their families constantly looking over their shoulders, waiting to be told that their mine was shutting down and their paychecks were stopping. And then, and then came along the current EPA leadership. And what be, may be the most flagrantly offensive tactic aimed squarely at undoing coal. This agency has singled out what I believe it saw as a politically expendable region of the country and imposed a wholly new permitting regime. This EPA has run roughshod over the states and my home state and others in central Appalachia to impose its own ideological agenda. It usurped the legal authorities of other federal agencies. It brazenly misused and abused its regulatory powers to put a stranglehold on coal mine permitting in these states. This is not just my assessment. This is the assessment of the courts, which found that the EPA, uh, which found, and I quote, the EPA has overstepped its statutory authority under the Clean Water Act and infringed on the authority afforded by law to the states, end quote. I know quite possibly better than anyone else on this floor today how the regulatory arm of government can wreak havoc on the people we represent. I know because the real front lines of this war are not here in Washington. They run through the hills and hollows of southern West Virginia, throughout our coal fields, through our every vein. And the true soldiers in this war are our coal miners who simply want to do their jobs. They want to earn an honest living and decent benefits for themselves and their families. Now, I've been proud to stand in this body for over three decades, to stand in the trenches and fight with our coal miners and I'm not about to break with them one iota. In defense of our coal miners, along with Chairman Micah of our Transportation Committee and myself, we drafted H.R. 2018, the Clean Water Cooperative Federalism Act, which is a key part of this bill we consider today, as Chairman Gibbs knows well and has been helpful as well. I have as well supported the other measures that comprise this legislation when they pass the House as standalone bills with the exception of the base bill to which they are attached as it has not been considered on the floor on its own. 
And I stand here now on this floor in support of this bill to once again defend our coal miners and their families in my state of West Virginia. Coal miners have risen up against their government before. Just look at the history. They've marched on Washington before. We've heard their voices. And if this EPA continues to turn a blind eye to the law to impose its anti-coal views, if it continues to unlawfully mess with our miners to cut off their paychecks and cut short their dreams, then I have a message for the EPA from the folks back home. You've not heard the last from us. You've not heard the last at all. American workers want to work. Jobs are hard to come by these days. This government ought not to be a party to eliminating the ones that still ex exist. So in defense of our coal miners' jobs, I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting this bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Ohio. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have no more speakers, so I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Ohio reserves. Gentleman from West Virginia.